guys? We're back. I'm Brandon, your host, and we're on another show of the Feelers Pursuit of Freedom podcast. And today's guest is another high-level entrepreneur. I'd like to welcome you guys to uh, Jude. Hey, Jude, how's it going? Appreciate you coming on. No, for sure, Brandon. Thank you for having me this morning. Great to be here. Yeah. So tell us, I know a little bit about what you do, but tell us uh, where you came from, where you live, what you started doing, and and uh, why you started putting a little bit of that money into, into apartments. Uh, perfect for sure. So um, I'm Jude Mendonca, known as Jude the Barefoot Millionaire Mendonca. Um, a little story behind that nickname, but uh, from Montana, up in the north parts of uh, America here, you know, living in the cold, living in the heat. We we do uh, commercial, residential, multifamily real estate. Um, commercial is kind of my favorite niche. I'm actually working on another uh, big 32,000 square foot project right now. Um, means a partner we also own a manufacturing company out of China where we build cell phone parts and then we manufacture our own cell phone accessories bluetooth headphones things like that um yeah kind of just an all-around entrepreneur you know investing as many things as i can and increasing the streams of revenue to get that whole freedom oh yeah that's why i named this podcast what i named it because i think most entrepreneurs They'll, they'll work to the day they die, but they're pursuing some form of their idea of freedom. And, right, for sure. Uh, yeah, yep. that's awesome. You know, for, for a lot of the entrepreneurs, as I say, you know, entrepreneurs, someone will, who, want, who, who works 80 hours for themselves so they don't have to work 40 hours for someone else because it's that right. sense of freedom. Even though we're working, it's for us. Yeah. We don't care. <laughs> right, right. All right, so how long have you been doing the manufacturing thing? And, and, and again, I don't know a whole lot about Jude here, but uh, you got the manufacturing, you got the real estate, you got podcasting, video recording, um, some form of coaching, it sounds like. So, um, I guess we'll just dive in from the beginning, why you got into entrepreneurship and then work our way up a little bit. Okay. So go all the way back then. Um, well, I grew up, uh, I grew up poor, uh, you know, living in a trailer park, uh, our very first trailer didn't even have a front door on it. Um, you know, my dad was a drug dealer. My, that was my stepdad who'd been in my life since I was three. My real dad had never been around. Mm-hmm. Um, but my dad being a drug dealer, you know, he was entrepreneurial in his own right, <laughs> respect. Right. So I'll give him credit for that. So I always saw that him working for himself and my mom owned a very small beauty salon, but I had some uncles that were incredibly wealthy and did some big things. One of them owned a big uh, mechanical plumbing company in town. It's one of the actual biggest in the state of Montana. Another uncle owned his own electrical company, things like that. But I kind of went the route of my dad, did a lot of bad. I spent most of 16 through 21 homeless before, you know, finally pulling my head out of my arse and, you know, getting motivated onto some entrepreneurial stuff myself. But I had friends in my life that were very entrepreneurial. And, you know, as I was living that bad life, I was kind of starting to look at them. And this one kid in particular that I grew up with, who his parents would have him read like rich dad, poor dad, things like that at a very young age. You know, he, I'm bouncing in and out of my car, people's couches, uh, living under an underpass. And I'm looking at him and he's got this big, beautiful truck. He's got houses. He's got his own company. You know, he's going on trips around the world. And it's like, wow, I'm doing 21 wrong. Right. Um, you know, there were some other things that ha- happened. Uh, I won't get into all the details now, but uh, I wind up going into a McDonald's one day. And I see this guy. He's got to be 45, you know, 48, looks haggard. And he's learning how to do the fry machine from some 15-year-old kid. And that was kind of like the nail in the coffin for me. I was like, I'm not going to be that guy. So I dropped all my friends like overnight, moved out of the house that I had just moved into. I was working at this restaurant and I moved in under this uh, overpass and I spent the whole winter outside sobering up, getting clean and just focusing on work. From there, you know, started hanging out with better people started learning trades, went into carpentry, things like that. Cause I knew, I knew real estate was something all millionaires shared, Mm -hmm. but I didn't know anything about it, but I knew, well, if I could fix homes, maybe one day I could flip homes. Right. Started there, went working through there. Um, and years later ended up starting my first business, which was in the medical marijuana field. We built that up to multiple stores across the state. We're doing very, very well at it with, uh, 
about $7,000 we started the company with. We turned it into three and a half million a year. Lost it all overnight. <laughs> they, they changed the law on us and me and my partners due to some past things. We couldn't be in it anymore. So we had to yeah. get out of it. <clears throat> Excuse me. Had to start over again and ended up building a cell phone company, which led to the manufacturing company that I'm in now. One of the parts suppliers that we had uh, ended up going through a big hiccup in his system. His American partner, she messed up on a lot of things. They weren't uh, paying taxes for years. That'll do it. Import taxes. Um, they weren't paying proper postage. So they ended up getting shut down in the States. So him and I got together. Uh, we spent all of 2016 fixing all those issues, restarting everything, getting importing, reset up. And then 2017, we relaunched the company together. Um, 2018, we're on track to break 20 million this year. And I just spent a week out in China. We've developed some new products that we're getting ready to roll out. And we're hoping to turn 2019 into a $40 million year. So we're nice. in we, America. We're in Germany. Uh, we just got into the UK. Um, we're in India, which India is a weird market, but. Yeah. I watch a guy on YouTube that uh, travels around uh, to different countries in the Asian and Indian areas um, that. Uh, uh, we'll make his own iPhone. So he'll go to all the different little markets, pick out the little chips and stuff. And I forget his <laughs> name now, but I've seen those markets that the, he has to go into. And I'm like, man, that is crazy out there. Oh man. I got some videos I'm going to be dropping over the next couple of weeks. If you follow me at all on Facebook, but mm -hmm. um, I, there's just these skyscrapers. I mean, so tall, you know, 30, 40, 50 stories. And each floor is literally just a market filled with little stalls the whole way up. Really? stuff to shop through it's amazing what's going on over there that'd be awesome actually i love going yeah. to those little markets oh yeah it's it's incredible i mean it's it's overwhelming but it's so much fun <laughs> yeah no, that's awesome so you chose the uh cell, well you said you started a cell phone company and then you went into manufacturing why did you well you told me before the interview but why did you choose cell phones right so when we lost the one business um we, there was four of us partners. One of the partners went through and went to all the warehouses and stole all the harvest. Um, we literally lost everything overnight. You know, we were hoping to be able to sell out, have money to go do something else. So by the time we sold off what we had left, paid off all the debt, we each walked away with about seven to $10,000. So Ouch. yeah, <laughs> well, had this opportunity, um, that same really good friend of mine that I was talking about who I grew up with, who was always doing something awesome, you know, him and a buddy had some cell phone stores and they were like, Hey, you know, we're thinking of franchising these, you know, are you interested? So it was like, yeah. So we took that $10,000. Well, I took that $10,000, gave it to my wife to live off of borrowed another 10 grand from a different friend. And me and a partner opened up one of these cell phone stores for way less money than we should have been able to open one. Uh, right. we, we lived in the back of the store for about four months, uh, eating off $5 a day to split between the two of us while we got the store up and running. But we, we went into that field because one, the opportunity was there. And two, as I kind of told you before the thing, my buddy, that was the same one. He'd been to the Philippines and other countries. And one of the things he noticed was people didn't have beds. You know, they didn't necessarily have food that day, but they had cell phones. Right. You know, cell phones is like liquor and the barber. It doesn't matter what's going on in the world. You're going to get a haircut and you're going to get a shot. So. Yeah. And, you know, and, cell phones is in that same market, so it made sense to get into it. Yeah, and uh, tobacco. I've been thinking about that right. a lot lately because um, if, if shit ever does hit the fan, and I'm like a, a mini prepper, and yeah. uh, so we keep a lot of food in the garage, and uh, uh, we could probably live, I don't know, six plus more months off the food we have there, but we, uh, aside from the ammunition and all the other cool stuff, we don't have anything to barter with people other than our own food supply. So I've been right. joking with Ashley, but I'm pretty dead serious we need to buy a crap ton of alcohol and tobacco and just stockpile it in the yes. garage because yeah. if, if something does happen that's our money cash 100%. and gold and silver it ain't shit then so uh, yeah really because people can't do anything with the gold and silver yeah. you know except use it as money to trade back and forth but yeah people would rather have a shot you know yep. during that time they would rather have some tobacco as you said 
right. something to just take off the weight of whatever crashed around them and what they're feeling. So, yeah. Yep. That's perfect. So what, one thing I always try to tell people, and I don't have such an amazing story as yours, but uh, it's those trials and tribulations that get mo- most successful entrepreneurs where they are. Uh, I, I don't know what the percentage is, but I would say upwards of 90% or more uh, entrepreneurs have failed pretty bad. I mean, you were producing three and a half million in this uh, medical marijuana business, and then you walked away with seven to 10,000 a piece. I mean, that's a, that's a nice, that's a stab in the heart right there. That, that oh, yeah. sucks. So, you know, uh, emotionally, and this is where, you know, mindset and growth really come in. Cause when it happened, I wanted to kill myself. I mean, mm-hmm. flat out, I wanted to die. Like I had this wife, we had just had our second kid and I was a guy who, you know, made eight to $10 an hour and thought that was the world. So to lose a business like that, I mean, it, it was life changing and I felt like a failure yeah. for weeks. I would go in early in the morning, you know, and I had a bottle of Everclear sitting there and I thought about just chugging it down each day and ending it in all reality. And then finally, you know, good Lord willing, I broke through that and realized, you know, this happens. It happens to other people. And one thing, you know, you've seen other rich people say is if they love or that they say about, you know, the super wealthy is if they lost it all, they'd build it back much faster the next time. And yep. we did, you know, things came back much faster because we'd already made mistakes and we'd learned from those mistakes and it just helped knowing what to do the second time around. Now I feel comfortable. Now I flat out think you could drop me anywhere in the world with nothing and I'd figure a way to come back, especially because of real estate, you know, you don't yep. need money for real estate. I'd go pick up some houses within a week yep. right back on my feet. Yep. Yeah. That's what I've been trying to tell. And we spoke about this before, but uh, my girlfriend Ashley is trying to start this draw shipping thing, and she's she's uh, about three months into it, and and I'm telling her, you either gotta double down, put more money into it, or just chop shop and and start a new one. And she she can't get over that. Well, I can't fail on my first attempt, and I'm in. I, I listen to a lot of these uh, drop shipping and e-commerce podcasts, and most of them build like 30, 40 stores before one pops. And I keep yep. trying to tell her that, and uh, that's just one of the the fears of being a, a, a new, new uh, person in the entrepreneur world uh, as she is. But uh, it's, yeah, it's you have to, to, to make it successful, you have to be willing to fail. You have to be willing to fail hard and fast, you know, because the faster you get through those failures, the faster you get to that win. And I agree with that completely. Like with the drop shipping thing, you know, is you, they spread it out, you know, they're try 12 different things and see the one that hits and then they focus on it. It's okay to have those 11 failures. You know, nobody yeah. remembers your failures at the end. They remember the big success. Right. Yeah. And with your, uh, uh, with your medical marijuana business, uh, what were kind of like the hurdles that you ran into? How many years did you run that before it exploded on you? So we, uh, well, it exploded almost day one. Um, a lot of it just because of the history me and my partners had in the facility, in the, you know, world, uh, mm-hmm. few of us had been doing things on the black market anyway. So it was pretty easy to just take things commercial, you know, (laughs) Uh, bring it legal. People really like the idea of, you know, being able to go to a store whenever they want instead of calling you and waiting hours for you to drive to their house or meet them somewhere down in the middle of the night. Um, But, you know, the biggest hurdles at the beginning was one, figuring out how to lead a team, how to work with people. Um, I came from restaurants and corporate restaurants. So at the beginning, I had that mentality of, you know, boss, employee, you're here to make me money. And that's it. Yeah. And, you know, that that's the wrong way to go about it. So through reading and learning and studying other things, you know, started realizing like, oh, be a leader, you know, make them part of the team, yeah. teach them the dream and the goals of the company, you know, give them that passion and they'll grow with it. But there was a lot of headaches in that first year. Um, we also had some manufacturing issues, which, you know, growing of the product and everything like that, right. you know, hiring the right people that actually knew what they were doing and didn't say what they were doing, learning how to investigate people and, you know, see if they actually knew what they were talking about. Um, you know, yeah. we probably lost a million dollars that very first year, just in harvest, not going right. So, right. I mean, not many people grow up or have that natural, the the green thumb. They can't just like go into even just growing tomatoes 
Yeah. It, it can be pretty difficult for a lot of people. So growing something to a standard that you could sell it, and I don't know anything about it, but I assume there's a quality control issue there. You can't oh, just yeah. grow some some shitty marijuana plants and expect to sell them for, for marketable quality. But um, that's I never thought about that, actually having to bring in somebody that knew how to grow. Because I, when I think about the medical marijuana industry, I think about, okay, you got a greenhouse, you got the misters or some sort of irrigation systems and the lights, and it's all complicated. But I never thought about having to hire somebody to – to grow them for you. I just figured it was something, I guess this is a smarter way to do it too, since you don't know how yeah. to do it. You know, it, it's a weed, you know, it'll grow anywhere. It'll grow on its own, but depending how you grow it really mm-hmm. dictates the quality of it. And that's for sure. I mean, that's why you've got Mexican brickweed over, you know, your good chronic, your good nugs. And mm-hmm. it, it, it takes, it takes that very, uh, what do you call it? Um, I, I guess just finesse, you know, really knowing what you're doing and understanding that it's a science. Yeah. And even more so since I, since I was in it back then, I mean, it, I've looked into it now and seen what guys are doing and the science has gone above and beyond where we were even at back then. Like it's, it's incredible what these yeah. guys figure out and what they understand. All right. Speaking of plants and science, have you thought about, uh, distributing or, uh, producing seeds? Um, no, I've never thought about that. I have looked into the CBD market though, mm-hmm. um, because you can do that nationally. Uh, yeah. but I don't know the, uh, well, I don't know, and, the that, and I didn't mean specifically marijuana seeds. I thought, uh, just, uh, vegetable seeds. Cause it's back to the, oh. to the, um, uh, the prepping and the what ifs and business and money in general is, uh, <clears throat> I used to do, I used to drive 18 wheelers and I would deliver, um, uh, crates and uh, pallets to uh, vegetable farms out in California. And I, I was talking to this farmer one time and telling him, or he was telling me where he was getting his seeds from. And it was some guy out of Mexico that was a multi billionaire just for storing and warehousing seeds, vegetable seeds, wow. strawberries, onions, lettuce, tomato, all that stuff. And for some reason, our conversation about growing wheat, maybe think about the seeds of vegetables, but right. uh, it'd be yeah, something cool. That's something I never would have even thought about, but now I'm a little curious about that market. Yeah, because you think if it's one of those things that it's 100% always going to be needed. Like if you watch a lot of uh, movies, uh, like End of the World things, if we end up living on Mars, we got to have freaking seeds up there. <laughs> right. Or if, uh, you know, anything happens, uh, even myself, I, I mean, I don't have a garden myself, but my mom has an acre and she grows some stuff, but everybody at one point or another has thought about growing a garden or will have to grow a garden when the, when shit hits the fan. So Mm -hmm. it's an industry I I thought about before too. Yeah, no, that's a really good idea. That's a, it sounds like something your girl should be looking into. Right. right (laughs) Let me know how it goes. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I don't know how I I never researched it. I don't know what the competition and the market is like, but it seems like something that would be, at least I should start stockpiling myself. Right. Uh, because I actually, I think that you, you could probably buy five gallon buckets full of different seeds, but pretty cool. Just yeah, some, I know, I know a prepper um, in town who he's, he's stockpiled some buckets of seeds, but beyond that, you know, I've never thought about anything beyond that besides having it so you could grow food someday just in case. Yeah. But yeah. Even just the trade value of it, but yeah, the monetary value, I never thought about that. I'm really interested in that. I want to look into that market. Yeah. Well, I just gave you an idea. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. awesome. So you went from the manufacturing uh, and, and the plant industry, you broke into the cell phone. Now you're manufacturing, you're going to China, you're going straight to the manufacturer of those. Um, and now you're building your own products, headphones, Bluetooth sets. Um, and was that through... And that's one of the things Ash is actually dealing with is the quality of the stuff that she's getting through right. these drop shipping. And so we'll have stuff sent out to us, but you fly out there and check it out firsthand. You don't right. wait the three, three to six weeks for it to come in. Right. So, so that's one of the great things about what we have. So my partner is actually Chinese. Um, we have a corporate office in our own warehouse out in Shenzhen. Um, so he's on the ground floor there. He gets to go investigate everything every day. He gets to go into the manufacturing plants. Mm-hmm. There's actually some of these manufacturers that have what's called an Amazon certification um, yeah. to show that they make something of quality. And most people 
don't even know that exists or even how to find that. Well, we're on the ground floor there, so we get to find that. We right. get to work with the best people. Not saying everything we've made has been gold. There have been some, uh, you know, manufacturers we've gotten t- tied with, built something. And it's like, oh, that's not good. That doesn't work the way it's right. supposed to do. But we we do our best quality control right out there as we can. Um, we have about sixty employees at our offices there, and. You know, we'll get products in, 10 of them will sit down, test through everything, check it out for a few days. And it, it, it makes it much, much nicer than, you know, going on Alibaba, AliExpress, like so many drop shippers do, mm-hmm. randomly picking something, listing it, and then finding out it's trash. Yeah. Yeah. That's one of the things she's concerned about big time. Right. Uh, so your partner lives there in China. Yes. Yep. That's cool. So yeah. <clears throat> that makes things a lot easier because I've thought about doing stuff like that, but I'm like, man, I don't have anybody. I don't, I don't speak a, a lick of Chinese, nor do I know anybody that speaks it. So it'd be pretty hard, but, um, so you manufacture it and do you, do you wholesale it to bigger companies like say Sony or do you yeah. distribute it yourself? So right now we've been distributing ourselves, uh, mainly through Amazon, eBay, mm-hmm. uh, jet, things like that. We're currently in the market of setting up our B2B. So, Sorry, I'm a little dry today. Um, I bought this big warehouse office building in Montana recently, and we're setting up our warehouses in here. We've been remodeling some offices to develop a call center, and then we're going to start doing B2B direct into businesses, cell phone stores like what I used to own, because I really understand that market. Um, The smaller like cell phone stores, cell phone repair stores, the big companies, big distributors won't touch them. So these guys have trouble getting quality stuff. So they do what the drop shippers do. They go on Alibaba, you know, they go on eBay, they go on DHgate and they buy cheap crap that yeah. doesn't work, but they have to have something on their walls. So someone like us, if we come in with something of quality and contact these guys, they're going to eat it up all day long because no yeah. one's willing to sell them quality. And we are, you know, I'll work with a thousand little stores. Why not? Yeah. Right. Yeah, that's what the call center is for. And I hate buying those little, they, they say they're two amp uh, car chargers at the gas station, but it's really less than a one amp and you can't charge in, in 20 yeah. hours and definitely not in a 40 minute ride to the next house. But right. I right. hate buying that stuff. You got to keep switching it, plug it into your phone, tell it out. Twisting it. Works, yeah. And, yep. yep. <laughs> yeah. That's and exactly the, it. And those little, uh, those, those, ca- the charging cables themselves seem like they go out for some, like, I don't know right. how you, destroy a cable, but it happens. And that's all stuff too, that a lot of people don't understand. So you have to have certain certifications for your equipment to be able to work with Apple. You have to have certain certifications for it to be able to work with uh, Android. Um, All of our Bluetooth stuff, there are certain Bluetooth certifications you have to get, you know, in the programming and the IC chips and everything for it to be able to work properly with all the different devices. Mm -hmm. And this is stuff that all cost 10, 30, $50,000 just to get these certs. So yeah, that's crazy. That's quite the, quite the accomplishment. I mean, the, I don't know many people that have been in the, in the e-commerce world or have done the manufacturing thing, but there's so many moving parts and you look so stress-free. Right, right. You know, <laughs> well, you know, as I said, we started this in 2016, spent a whole year doing no business at all, just making sure legally we were – right with everything you know and yeah 17 getting things going going through the bumps and all that um you know we we were doing business in germany before we were doing it in america working out fine-tuning a lot of things so mm-hmm. uh, awesome but yeah no stress-free no there's definitely stress there but right commerce is a lot nicer in a lot of ways a uh, big part of the reason why i did push to go this way um i ended up selling out of my cell phone stores is when you have a brick and mortar store you're open nine to five, mm-hmm. Monday through Saturday, competing with competitors for a population of 100,000, 200,000. With e-commerce, we're open 24-7, even on Christmas, competing for a population of a billion, you know, yeah, 900 right. million, whatever it is. Yeah. It's insane. We need this much of the market to be successful. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I forget the numbers now, but there's always that. I see that uh, how to make a million dollars in a paragraph. It's sell thirty things at this price, a hundred things at this price, or a thousand things at twelve cents. You know, whatever. Those aren't our actual numbers, but uh, that's my mindset too. Is is I'm in real estate, so I'm doing 
little things at high dollars, but that's why I wanted her to get into uh, a lot of things at low dollars and sell it to a lot of people. And the the scales of our economics of scale is a little bit different in, in her world versus mine. Right. Yeah. You know, it, it's tough sometimes too seeing things when you're d- used to doing those big picture deals, you know, seeing those small deals, but you at least have that understanding. And a lot of people don't where, you know, you have this product. Yeah. You're only making $2, $5, whatever off of it, but mm-hmm. you're selling a million of them. You know, yeah. that adds up. Whereas you work on this one house still and yeah, you're going to make 40 grand, let's say, but it took what, three months, you know, right. six months. So yeah. Yeah. And that's the idea is to make the money net my now money, my active income money through flipping and to put it into cash flowing things like rentals and then into her company um, and wherever that brings us. But so that's what you're doing. You're taking your manufacturing money, dumping it into the real estate. So let's talk. You said you had an active or you're working on a 32,000 square foot building. Yeah, yeah. I actually got the paperwork sitting right here right now. We uh, sat down with the owner yesterday and hopefully there's going to be some big things out of it. This guy owns uh, multiple hotels, some other big commercial properties, and Mm -hmm. he's old and he wants to just get rid of it all. Um, So (laughs) yeah, yeah. (laughs) uh, I told him, I'm like, you know, once we get done with this deal, we're going to become best friends and do a lot of lunch meetings. You know that, right? And he was like, I'm all about it. Let's do it. But yeah, time um, to retire. (laughs) <laughs> we uh uh I'm always looking for more commercial properties and somebody said this place was for sale and it wasn't which was neat but ended up meeting the owner anyways and come to find out yeah he is all about selling um but it's a commercial building 32,000 square feet and the business inside of it which is a uh, an athletic club okay well, the partner that I'm bringing on with it, he owns the Grindhouse MMA gym, um, Will Grundhauser, which some of you have probably heard of him, some of you haven't. He's actually flying to New Jersey at this very moment to uh, compete in the ADCC uh, um, jiu-jitsu tournament to represent the U.S. for the world. Oh, um, nice. Phenomenal jiu-jitsu practitioner, um, one of the best in his weight class. Um, but we're bringing him as a partner, and the goal is to buy this building and this business He'll move his gym into this, run the gym and the business. So, you know, we'll have this good business creating cash flow, bringing in some monthly income. Mm -hmm. And then we'll have this building bringing in cash flow and creating income and some, you know, good uh, tax tax uh, advantages and all that. So. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And you you told me beforehand, but you're in the multifamily. You said your first apartment building. So how many how many doors units do you own and. So not a ton total doors that I own. Um, yeah. If you split up the apartments I'm at, I think 34, 34. Mm-hmm. And then um, commercial properties I've got, gosh, probably another 48 doors. Yeah. Okay. Oh. So still on the small end, um, got a lot more real estate. I need to catch up on. <laughs> yeah. Well, commercial is uh, worlds apart from, from multifamily too. Right. Right. The commercial I really like, you know, uh, the single family homes, cause I have 23 single family homes and I hate them. You know, if something yeah. goes wrong on a home, you got to fix it. It takes you months and months to recover that loss. Yeah. You know, uh, multifamily properties. If you have four units go down, but you have, let's say 10 that are still good, you know, it's still cash flowing. It's still working and paying for itself. So we like that with commercial though, man, like when everything's going smooth on those, you know, you've got the rents coming in, you've got your cams or triple net. So, you know, people are paying the maintenance, they're paying the taxes, they're paying the insurance. Mm-hmm. It's just cash flow. Yeah. It's everywhere on commercial. We love it. Yeah. I was going to ask you if you did triple net versus gross. You so you prefer the triple net or they just pay everything? Right. So in Montana, um, triple net's just now starting to pop up. You, mainly it's been uh, cams. So just common area maintenance fees that people charge. Mm-hmm. So on my big commercial property, I'm doing common area maintenance. So um, they're not paying the taxes, but they cover all the maintenance. They cover the utilities, things like that. Um, yeah. But that's, you know, another six grand a month that I'm not coming up with. Yeah. No, that's nice. Are you taking, uh, or do you have like retail shops in there? Are you taking a percentage of their, of their profits like uh, some of these owners do? Nope. or? Nope, they're just, yeah, they're just paying rents. You know, I, having owned retail stores, I am so against that. You know, yeah. that's why malls are dying. 
Yep. That's, that's true. That's how all of them run are ran. Yep. You know, I yeah. looked into, we looked into opening one of our cell phone shops in a mall and they went over how everything went. And then they were like, during the Christmas season, you know, rent goes up and we take a portion and it was like, whoa, whoa, Uncle Sam back down here. Right, like, right. Yeah. You know, that that's criminal. And yeah. these malls are dying because of their greed. There's no reason to be greedy like that. Learn to buy something right. Set yourself up in a good position on it where it'll cash flow and mm -hmm. just enjoy it, you know, yeah. for the long term. But these bigger companies that are owning these malls and strip malls and doing this to business, you know, they're strangle holding the middle class, they're weakening our economy and they're burning themselves out. And that's why people are going to Amazon. You know, yeah. why am I going to rent a shop from you when I can stay in my underwear and drop ship all day long? Yeah. Yeah. Are you, are you worried about that at all? Um, no. Cause so the commercial buildings that I bought, I've tried to buy things where they're businesses that have lasted through like 2008, um, things like that. So the building that I'm in right now, uh, we have a beauty school that covers most of it. Yeah. Um, they're a huge school. They've got like 250 students, you know, they're not doing retail. They're a school. Yeah. They're teaching They'll be there forever. Yep. Is. Yep. yep. Um, there's a dog groomer in there. There's a tattoo studio in there. There's a tanning salon. So trying to stay away from any of the retail uh, businesses. One of my mentors, he strictly does commercial buildings. He mm. owns a couple million square feet throughout Montana of uh, commercial real estate. And he's noticed that. So he has slowly um, switched any of the brick and mortars when they move out. Now he won't even, you know, uh, rent to or lease to a new brick and mortar store. He's looking for offices, people like that, you know, lawyers, yeah. uh, insurance, tax, accountants, anything like that, businesses that last through that stuff and need space. So yeah. No, that's awesome. You said uh I'll go for it. Oh, uh, I was gonna say, because yeah, I mean Amazon, Walmart, Jet.com, Shopify, all that stuff's taken over. So, you know, people are gonna be doing that stuff from home. Yeah. They don't need to open a shop. They don't need to pay all the excess uh, expenditures anymore. So, yeah, yeah. You said you had a, a salon school. Have you thought about uh, building out a small commercial space for those individual hair salon owners and just renting out booths or rooms? Um, I have not. These guys, they actually. Uh, so their school uses up a huge section and then they have another section where they have booths and things like that. And that's something they already do. Um, oh, gotcha. you know, uh, my mom owned a beauty salon growing up. I I've got no interest in, you know, kind of being into that world. I know there's money in it. Yeah. Um, I know some very successful people that have made a lot of money in it, but that's just nothing I'm interested in. Um, yeah. you know, if I'm going to, you know, if I probably had someone who wanted to partner and do that and they wanted to manage the headache of dealing with all those girls and things right. that come with that sort of stuff, the yeah, drama. I'd be all about that. You know, I'd build the space <laughs> out, sure, but yeah. I don't want to talk to anybody. Right. You know, I want freedom, so. <laughs> yeah, that's no, funny. Yeah, you get, I was thinking about that, too, and I was really gun ho about it, but then I was like, man, that's 30 chicks that I got to hear about what they how, what color – they messed up that day or what story they heard about some crazy husbands doing right. on the other side. And I'm not about the drama life. I just keep to yeah. myself. I'm very homebody. Just deal with my own stuff. I don't like hearing other people's drama. So that I was like, maybe that's not a good business model for me. Yep. Yeah. I've seen some of these girls. I mean, even just going to school, them get into big cat fights with each other and uh, you'll see 10 of them pulling them all apart. And I'm just walking by like, Oh man, I'm so glad this ain't my headache. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Commercial and multifamily. You got 34 doors in multifamily. They're all in Montana. Yeah. Uh, split between multifamily and single family homes. Um, yeah. All in Montana. We're currently working on spreading out to the Ohio market. Uh, mm -hmm. Me and a partner that's moving out to Ohio. Um, it's looking really good, you know, in the Midwest, there's a yeah. lot of opportunity out there right now. So want to yeah. get out there. I think it's good. You know, this is one thing I learned after losing that first business is, you know, multiple streams of income. It's something we all understand now. I didn't understand it back then, but now I know, I want multiple pots. So I even want my real estate spread amongst some other states just in case. You know, yeah. We all know a collapse of some sorts coming. So oh, yeah. you know, it's better to be spread around and hope one of them lasts. Yep. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Um, 
I don't want to keep you too much longer, but let's, oh, if you don't mind, we dive a little bit into your multifamily there. Uh, just about uh, your management and financing of those. Do you manage those yourself or do you have a property manager? So I used to manage myself. Um, you know, I wanted to be one of those people, save the money and do it yeah. all. And guys, that is the wrong mindset, you know, pursuit of freedom. You know, what he's doing here, my podcast, the freedom experience, like you'll see that term freedom, 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 yeah. focus on that. You know, when you buy something, buy it with the intent, buy it with a price point where you're going to have someone else manage it. Um, you know, I didn't vet things properly enough. You know, some of the tenants I'd get a little too close to, and then, you know, they needed help that month or, you yeah. know, they couldn't pay on time that month, things like that. And man, that kills you in the end. Uh, I ended up moving in somebody, actually a friend of mine who needed help, and he brought bed bugs into one of my apartment complexes, spread through the whole complex. Ten months, you know, it took us to get rid of the bugs, remodel everything, get the tenants out and all that stuff. And it was a mess. Cost, you know, tens and tens and tens of thousands of dollars. Um, all because I didn't have a property manager. There now I have property. Flow. Yeah, now I have property managers on everything. And my life is so wonderful. I went to China and I didn't worry about a thing. Yeah. Nothing. I came back, nothing burnt down. Everything's still, you know, running. Cash flow is still coming in. I get my check tomorrow. Like, I love it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so, just, just tell them, don't call me unless it's over 500 bucks. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And that's what we've worked out. So yeah, anything little they take care of, anything major, they get in touch with me. Yeah. Easy. That's nice. <laughs> that's cool. Um, and I, I don't know anything about the Montana market. Uh, what is, uh, I assume you have like a eight plex or 10 plex or something. Uh, mm -hmm. how, how did you do the, go about the financing on that? Did you go in so, with some so partners? That very first property, um, <clears throat> I did it the dumb way. I spent my own money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I had saved up some money over the years and ended up finding this place. Um, talked him down quite a bit. We did a bunch of negotiating, so that was good at least. But, you know, I ended up putting about $60,000 down to get into it. And every property since then, there have all been subject to uh, lease options or uh, owner finance deals. So nice. I don't put money down no more. Nice. All so. super creative. I mean, yep. That's cool. Yeah. 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 Yeah, you know, get that financial education figured out and save your own money to buy things like seeds and bullets and food. <laughs> yeah, perfect. Yeah. Right. No, that's pretty cool because uh, I I primarily hang around real estate investors and a lot of them will say, stay in your lane, do the one thing. But I'm like, yeah. man, I, w I want a tool belt that's well-rounded. I don't know everything about one thing. I know a little bit about multiples of different strategies. and and which was worked out for you well, it sounds like. I mean, you've been able to right. to do them all because subject two is no no walk in, walk in the park. You know, it's you don't have to know everything about everything, and you don't even have to know everything about one thing. You just need to know how to put a team together mm -hmm. and have the right team who knows the right things about the right things. You know, we've we've got a lawyer that understands subject two and does subject two very well. So. Yep. You know, he handles that. I don't need to know anything about it. You know, I just need to know how to write a check for him. That's all he cares about. And get right. the deal done. You know, yeah. doing a lease option, same thing. You know, we just need to know the lawyer that puts the contract together the right way so we don't get screwed and the old owner doesn't get screwed and everybody's yep. taken care of. Yeah. yeah. That was one of the hurdles I had to get over when starting this podcast is in my mind, I was like, I need to do something, you know, um, start a little meetup or do a podcast or write a book or something crazy. And all of them have their hurdles. And specifically with the podcast was, I don't want to learn audio and video editing. I think right. I do, but I don't, I don't want to spend the six months learning it and perfecting it. So um, I'll just record them. And then I'll send in my VA who will chop up the audio, send it to his video guy and then plug on the intro and outro. Uh, and I was able to start it a lot quicker once I finally decided I was going to do it. So. Yeah. Well, and that's part of that whole thing for freedom too. You know, uh, <clears throat> a lot of investors, you know, going back to managing the things themselves, you know, I know friends of mine that they would rather go work on a plumbing issue, take the entire day, you know, and use up all their time trying to figure out an issue to save 
80, $140. Whereas I'm, I'd rather spend two, three, four hundred dollars. No, it's fixed right. No, I didn't have to deal with it. And we're never going to have to deal with it again because it was done right. And I had my time to go do what I needed to do in other areas. You know, it's the same thing as you said with the editing and all that. Like, I don't edit my podcast. I hire someone to do it. Yep. You know, I could take the time. I could learn it. I can do anything anyone else can do if I put in the time and effort. But why? Yeah. You know, there's better things that I'm good at that I need to focus on and just focus on those one things. Yep, exactly. Yeah, and it took me, um, actually, it didn't take me long in the, in the real estate industry. In my first house, I did, first house, I did most of the work. And then my next deal I got, I didn't have the money. So I went to a guy to go look for the money. He was like, you know what? Better yet, I'll buy it. I'll get my crew in there and we'll finish and we'll split 50 50 on the back end. I'm like, what? That's freaking genius. Right? Just, so, <laughs> so for the next two months, I just watched him do all the work and I just went over there and checked on it every once in a while and got a check in three months. I was like, yes, that's the life right there. So yes. uh, that's actually been a big push of mine lately is, is partnering on deals, either being yeah. the money guy or being the lead guy. So, yeah. You know, and that's another mindset thing too that people hang up on. They're they're so scared to give up 20, 30, 40 percent mm-hmm. because you, you know, there's just that little bit of greed issue or just that fear mentality. Whereas, you know, understanding, hey, it's better to have 50 percent of a deal instead of a hundred percent of no deal. Exactly. You know, if you get fifty percent, forty percent of a hundred deals, how much further ahead are you? Yep. Partner with people all day long. Heck yeah. Yep. Especially in like your position, if someone else wants to go and do all the work and you just find the deal, sell the deal, whatever. Awesome. All day long. Let's do it. Yeah. Actually, what pretty cool and I did lately is I, I found a lead in an area that I knew a buddy of mine was buying exclusively in. He has a bunch of rentals out there. Yeah. And so I knew it was going to sell to him anyways. So I was like, hey, I'm going to sell this to you. But instead of paying me a wholesale fee of five or 10000 how about for the next 15 years, you give me yes. 200 bucks a month. And he was like, done. I was like, home run. <laughs> yes. Oh, that's beautiful. So, so yeah. many more wholesalers need to figure that out. And there's a couple, um, I'm deal a lot with uh, the group, the kingdom real estate. Um, I don't know if you've heard of them, like Jordan paid and Todd yeah. Fleming. Yep. Yeah. Um, so hang out a lot with those guys. And that's one thing, you know, I've seen them teach quite a few of their wholesale students to start doing. And some of those guys have really picked up on that. Like, yeah, five thousand dollar checks, cool. But imagine one hundred and fifty bucks a month. You know, for yeah, as you said the next fifteen years, something like that. Yeah. And you do twenty of those deals. Well, there's three grand a month. You're free. Most people are free at three grand a month. Yep. You no. Know? And you do some more. Do some more. Man, you got that residual cash flow, and you're not handling anything. You don't even right. have to deal with the property manager. No. Yeah, that's perfect. Actually, uh, Todd's book. And, and some phone calls with him sparked my idea of that. And I was like, well, I'm just going to go ahead and give it a shot and, and pitch it to him. And he didn't even think twice. He was like, done. It's less yeah. money he has to finance, less this, I mean, less everything. So why not? Yep. Yep. 100%. Oh, man, yeah. that's beautiful. I love that. I love it, man. I hope people are just eating up this podcast. That's good stuff right there. That yeah. right there is mi- worth a million dollars in education. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, a lot of wholesalers listen to this. So. They'll make it here. Maybe we can do do, do some more deals with them. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> well, man, I don't want to take up too much of your time. And and you're in so many different, uh, I guess, you get your fingers in so many different pies. I mean, they, there's no way to dig into all of them. But you know, I right. think we covered, we covered a lot of it. But I think it'd be cool to have you back on and talk about your manufacturing in the future. But for now. For sure. Um, yeah, will just keep it at that. If anybody wants to. Well, you have a coaching thing. So I don't, I don't even know what, you, what, you, what you're doing for the <laughs> The coaching. So what do you do there? Right. So, well, I've been doing a lot of uh, mentoring and business consulting. Uh, just people reach out to me, um, different businesses. Uh, but I'm doing some specified courses that are coming out soon, dealing with drop shipping and one dealing with e-commerce. Um, really? You know, and the reason for that being so many of these guys and you researching drop shipping, you probably get the ads on your Facebook and yeah. stuff. You know, the guy's like, oh, $30,000, this one product. Well, That's not a business. You know, those guys haven't learned anything yet at $30,000 on one product and the profit margins on drop shipping. Like when it comes down to it, that guy made a grand that month. You know, so I watching that, it's like, okay, somebody real needs to come in and do a real legit course and actually teach these people the ins and outs, how to contact the people in there, how to investigate things 
and how to actually build a legit business. I'm someone in the industry who we're doing more than eight figures a year. We're international in multiple countries. You know, we've got the background. We've got the proof of concept to actually show people. We have the experience. And I've also lost businesses and rebuilt up. So we can come in with a real course legitimately, show these people from the ground floor, you know, how to not just ride a fad through a drop shipping, but actually create a business. And that's what it should be about creating a business, but creating a business that, you know, helps create freedom for these people. You know, there's uh, that one guy, there's a lot of articles about him last year. I can't think of his name, but you know, he, they wrote articles on him cause he did $10 million a year on Amazon and he was going into stores buying clearance items. Yeah. And that's awesome. It's yeah. exciting. I love seeing stuff like that. And I'm glad it drives people, but they get lost in, you know, the sexiness of it and not understanding that, that's not a business. You know, that guy has to continuously do that nonstop and his profit yeah. margins are so low, whereas it's better, you know, let's learn some drop shipping, create some income that way. And then through the drop shipping, let's create a real e-commerce business and let's yeah. develop something and let's create something where you've got employees, you've got manufacturing set up and you can create a business that long term will be there. You yeah. Know? It's cool to sell someone else's product for a little bit when you find it on sale and stuff like that, but that's not long term and you got to keep bouncing from item to item and you got to stress. Well, what if there isn't anything this month that people are into? Yeah. You know? what, what if I don't get to find any good deals that month? So we need to create something. We need to start a real business and create a business. Not just sell people on the idea of, you know, the 25 year old kid running on the beach going $30,000, $30,000. Right. Yeah. You know? I hate that guru stuff. Yeah. You no, know, uh, me and Jordan Payne, we've talked a few times because you know, we're both doing well. We both make a ton of money, but we don't have Ferraris. We yeah. could. I actually turned down a Ferrari from Pejman Gahadimia last month. I, man, I thought about buying it, but we live in Montana. You know, yeah. we drive trucks and minivans. Yeah. You know? So we're not selling people on the image. We need to sell them on the legit business, the legit freedom. You know, what's real and what's going to hold them over long term and create something that's going to help change this country, real entrepreneurship. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Well, hopefully Todd Fleming doesn't make it this far in the interview since he knows both of you. <laughs> he turned down the Ferrari because <laughs> he keeps sending me text messages. Look at this one I'm looking at right now. Like, ah, uh, cool. <laughs> Right, right. Yeah, he, he 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 was probably looking at the same one I was that one time too. Man, oh, it was such a good deal too. They kind of kicked myself in the ass for not buying it, but yeah. what do you do with one of those in Montana? Right. You no, know? I yeah. got one street I can drive it up and down, and that's it. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, no, that's perfect. That's exactly what I'm trying to get Ashley to do is to start in the drop shipping and then start um, uh, doing the manu. She'll, she'll find a niche eventually, and she'll start manufacturing that niche, but. And, and I learned that idea. Um, I listened to a podcast and I think they stopped actually, and they might be exclusively on YouTube, but seven figure entrepreneur. Hmm. Um, to check them out. Well, so I watch a YouTube channel called daily driven exotics and then oh, yep. he does email marketing and, um, affiliate marketing. But then he learned a lot of the affiliate marketing through his other guy, seven figure entrepreneur. And I forget their names now, but, the one guy's name is Damien uh, for Daily Driven Exotics, but um, that's what they do. It's affiliate marketing, yeah, all that stuff, and they, and they started out in drop shipping, and then they started branding their own items through that manufacturer. They were getting a lot of the drop ship out of, and so they started you know, just throwing their labels on them. Yeah, yeah, which, which and that's exactly it. Cool. That's what you need to do. You know, so many people they just focus on one cheap item that they know they can push through through a little while, and then they're taught to just go find the next one. Yeah. <laughs> Instead, find that item that people love. As you said, you know, you told her something that's going to go through all those different turns that people crave. They're always going to want yeah. and get it selling and then create your own brand off of it. Yeah. You know? See if there's patents on it. If there isn't, there's no trademarks, you know, or if you just have to change the design a little bit because you can work with the manufacturers on that. Yeah. Get your logo on it and push it through. Turn it into a business. Yeah. Yeah. You know? That's awesome. So how can people reach you about everything we've talked here and specifically the the, the mentorship there. Right. So um, I'm not sure how far away this video is from coming out, but email, they can reach me at uh, um, jude at judemendonza.com. Um, 
hopefully within the next month, the website will be up and out and that'll be judemendonsa.com. And they can also reach me on there once that's out. And then we also have our own podcast, the Freedom Experience Podcast, which, you know, I recommend everybody listen to where, you know, we talk about all kinds of different things between business, real estate, stuff like that. And then we have our bonus episodes on Friday where we just have fun, talk about, you know, sports, MMA, guy stuff, um, emotions, yeah. whatever. So it's awesome. Times. That's all. Are you guys on? So I've got, I've got an, um, a podcast app and also um, uh, Spotify. Are you guys on Spotify? Um, we are not on Spotify yet. I think that's the last one I need to get on, but we're on Stitcher. We're on iTunes. We're on pretty much all the most okay. basic ones out there. Well, I'll link it down below. I'm a podcast fanatic. Uh, so awesome. I'll, I'll be listening in. Well, man, I appreciate it. Uh, thanks for coming on. I mean, that was almost an hour of just like bomb after bomb after bomb. So we'll have to have you back kind of talk on one specific thing one time. So awesome, Brandon. Thank you so much. This was much appreciated and a lot of fun. Thank you. No, I appreciate it. Thanks a lot, man. Definitely. Have a good day. You too.